yeah, back to the movie show, you know, here, here on a given Tuesday with George Kaysen. George, welcome back to your show, the movie show. How you been? Thank you. I'm doing good, just busy in my old Okay, day. all right, good. Well, you're in school, and, you know, it always has a, an effect on things. Um, so today in the movie show, uh, we're going to talk about official secrets. Official secrets uh, is uh, concerned with the violation of the Official Secrets Act of, eight, of 1989 in Britain. Uh, by a woman by the name of Kate Gunn. This is all true. And it's uh, because of that, it's a fantastic movie. Um, so George, uh, my first question to you is, um, did you relate to her? Did you understand her? Did you understand what she was doing and why? I totally understand what she was doing. I totally understand her emotions, her feelings, her thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, she was saving her country from going to war unnecessarily uh, for the nation, for, the, for Britain and for the United States. Uh, but I have my own feelings about what this was all about. When I was at university going for uni, um, urban planning masters, all the professors would have on their doors um, mobilization, mobile, M-O-B-I-L, it's all about oil. It was all about oil, uh, Houston, Bush family. Um, yeah, that was, you know, that was the point. In, the, in this country, a lot of people opposed that war. <clears throat> and uh, in Britain, too, a lot of people were protesting that war. The whole thing was a, a charade. Uh, but, you know, at the time, and uh, this is, you know, uh, honor to uh, Colin Powell, um, you know, the government wanted the government under Bush wanted the war, and Colin Powell, you know, um, he went along with it. He shouldn't have. I later recognized it was a huge mistake about you know fabricating these weapons of mass destruction, and that wasn't the only thing. That wasn't the only thing that that Bush did in order to advance the war. They, at the end of the movie, they give you the stats, right? Um, One hundred and fifty-one thousand was the low estimate of how many Iraqis were killed, the high estimate was a million. Um, the number of, of killed American troopers, uh, what was it, 4,600? The number of wounded was uh, much more than that. I, I want to say about 40,000 Americans were wounded uh, and, you know, maimed and disabled for life. We learned about that. Um, and it was a, a major war, a major conflagration. And, and although we, quote, won, end quote, the war, um, the, you know, there were and there are real questions about we should have done that. They had nothing to do with 9-11. Um, they had nothing to do with, um, with Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. Um, Bush was trying, they say Bush was trying to finish unfinished work that his father had started and stopped. Um, at the advice of Colin Powell, by the way, back in the early 90s in Iraq. So, I mean, it's a, it's a shocking movie about the United States, isn't it? Yes, definitely still has uh, considerations for today. I mean, uh, so we can look back and try to see, make less, take lessons from that. But Colin Powell was duped. I mean, he was, I don't think he was part of the, this inner circle. Uh, they all knew Rumsfeld and all of them. They knew that this was not the truth. But um, as I said, this there were personal interests involved here, that and not our national interests, but personal interests. And we'll get into that too a little more if, we, if you'd like. Yeah. Well, we talk a lot about uh, the confidence of the American people in the American government, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and although we quote won the, the war, taking over Iraq and toppling Sodom. Ultimately, you know, he, he gave his life. Um, um, and, and I think, I think um, most people really didn't appreciate it. Most people in this country, and they, they, they had great questions and they were seriously reserved about um, the, what the government was doing. And they, uh, at the end of the day, they, had, they lost confidence in the government. They lost confidence in uh, what? Um, uh, Cheney and uh, Rumsfeld, and for that matter, of course, Bush, who, who led the team. Um, and this was uh, kind of through the lens 
of one woman in her 20s by the name of Kate Gunn, who worked for the CGHQ, which was an intelligence organization uh, in Britain, part of the uh, British government. And this memo from, it's a really incredible story, this memo from somebody uh, in the uh, in the intelligence establishment in Washington oh, yeah. yes. sent this memo to his counterpart, maybe it was Tony Blair, and said, uh, you've got to come along with us. You've got to join our war effort. You should bring you know, the, the UK in with us, um, even if you have reservations about the war. Um, and um, Tony Blair was advised by his uh, legal advisors um, not, not to do that, that the war would have been illegal Without without a vote of the uh, the EU, I think, and there was no uh, agreement by the EU, and uh, he nevertheless caused Britain to enter the war with George Bush, W. Um, and so this memo became critical because this was proof that the uh, American you know group of henchmen uh, working for um, Bush. Um, was doing very manipulative things to force the UK, the government in Britain, and other countries in Europe to join that war, even though there was no evidence of mass weapons of mass destruction, and there was no good reason for it, and they didn't agree. But he sort of twisted their arms, all of them, including um, you know, trying to get dirt on the individual representatives to the EU. Uh, which and use that to um, you know extort their votes. Um, this memo was a, a reveal, and through the eyes of this one woman who read the memo and said, "Holy moly, this is wrong, wrong, wrong." So, what happened after she made that decision? Well, she had made the decision, and she contacted a friend who who was um, anti-war activist. And she provided the, that memo to her, to this friend. And then from there, it went to uh, the news agencies, right? Um, and, and they were thinking back and forth, should they reveal this, should they not? But eventually they did uh, through the, there was, they, they had their correspondent in Washington um, who was played by Razy Fees or something like that. And, and he was really emphatic about, um, you know, revealing this and then finally they did reveal it and um then well, let's let's talk for a moment about the reveal no. you know this is uh, sort of like the washington post um you know revealing uh, what nixon had done right. um you know the, 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 you, you always get in trouble when you reveal something that's embarrassing um or or the reveals against the law um you know, because it's um, you know an official secret that's why the Official Secrets Act is so important here. So uh, the remarkable thing is that they had this memo. It came from the anti-war activist, which is not a, necessarily a credible source. Um, and they published it after a, a very strenuous argument in the editorial board. Right. They, they decided to take the chance and publish it because although the newspaper um, had supported the war up until that point, this memo changed the mind of the of the editor and uh, and it was a really good story and he decided he'd go with it and take the risk even though he might wind up in jail under the official secrets act mm -hmm. so they published it and it hit the newsstands the next day in full do you remember what happened when it hit the newsstands that was one of the most remarkable things in the movie and in reality do you remember what happened george the only thing I, I can remember is that right now is the Drudge Report came out and stated that some of the language was uh, in the memo, it's a pur purported memo, was British, British way of speaking instead of English way of speaking. So that thing is, it, it, like it was a fake kind of thing that come from anti-war activists. Yes, so, so, the, so the Americans we're using American spelling like uh, recognize and favorable. Um, and the Brits uh, spell those words differently. <laughs> and, and, and somebody looked at it carefully as it appeared in the newspapers. Oh, wait a minute. 
This is not the American way of spelling. This is the British way of spelling. This is a phony. And so all the interviews, um, I forget, Martin Bright was his name, the reporter at the London Observer newspaper. Um, it was scheduled to do all these interviews with an international cable news networks and the like, and they all canceled on him. Yeah. And he found the reason was that they had decided it was a phony based on the spelling. So there was this very tense moment. This is also one of the high points of the movie. This very tense moment in the newsroom, in the you know editorial newsroom of the Observer, where the editor is shouting at the top of his lungs, where they and they had the original memo, which had the American spelling, right. and the editor is shouting to every corner of that newsroom, "Who changed the spelling?" Remember? Exactly. <laughs> right. Remember what happened? Yeah, it was it was one of the low level staffers that. Uh, she used spell check, and in England, with the spell check, it changed the, uh, the 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 spelling of some of these words to the British version, and that's what was released. So the Drudge report, you know, Drudge, he he back then he was really very powerful. He had put it on his Drudge report, and it was this big brouhaha. They thought they were all going to get arrested. They were, you know, made made them look really bad. And then finally, that was the thing. So they released the original memo wording, and then we knew. Then they knew it wasn't a fake. But she, she started crying, you know. You spell check, you know. She just inadvert inadvertently figured, oh, well, you spell check. I'll make sure everything's right before it goes Why out. Why did you spell check on original evidence? Why did you do that? Well, I always do that. That's my job. <laughs> exactly. I mean, she's, that's what she. You know, it's like. Sometimes people get into this rote thing, you know, they don't think, you know, it's just the, their way of doing things that they're comfortable with that. So she yeah. did that and it cre almost created a major, you know, thing, but then it, it was, it was shown to be accurate. So yeah. Um, yeah. now one of the things that before we, we go on, Saddam Hussein, just, just as an aside, he was against Al Qaeda. He was against these jihadist groups and by removing him, they, they became more powerful, you know, and that's what we're dealing with still. And then, you know, we, another quick aside, you know, we messed up in Iran. We, we got rid of Mossadegh and then the British petroleum, British and Americans had, had brought down the Shah. You know, they eventually brought that because he was getting too powerful. And then you got these crazies over there that, that want to blow up the nuclear bomb to Israel. So where we create our own problems, we should have. I mean, Saddam was a secularist. He was a he was a bad guy. He was killing Kurds. You know, he was he was a horrible man. But by removing him, you unleash these jihadists. So I mean, we create our own problems. Well, I'll leave it at that. I'll, you know, anything I'll leave it at that. But none of those guys really, aside from Colin Powell, who should have known better, uh, Rumsfeld and. Um, 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 the vice president Cheney, they, they they didn't know better. They did not know, and and um, I don't think Bush uh, had done very well in school, and he didn't know that you, you want to topple somebody. You know, there's an after effect. There's a vacuum. What moves into the vacuum? I mean, it was predictable, and uh, there were a lot of people writing stories about it uh, and academic articles at the time. But it, he didn't listen to them. Uh, he had his own agenda. But going back to the story, so what, what is very interesting, and it goes to the next movie I would like us to review, uh, is, is the British, how they handled this. Okay, the, the Official Secrets Act, very serious business, essentially espionage. Um, and this woman, you know, with the wrong end of it, and she broke down in the investigation with the intelligence people, and she just told them, I, I can't stand the pressure anymore. I can't stand, you know, being a traitor like this. Uh, I did it. I revealed this to, you know, the um, the anti-war group, and I broke the law. Okay, and uh, it's in large part the movie is her story, and I'm sure that the individual, the real Kate Gunn, was suffered a lot over this, but the actress was good. And furthermore, she was um, either living with or married to uh, a, a Middle Eastern guy, remember? And yeah. they, the Brits harassed her and him 
um, until the cows came home. They were just so mean. And I said to myself, gee, you know, you, the Brits are always so courteous and, and uh, you, know, they, uh, you know, treat people very nicely, etiquette, whatnot. No, not in this case. They were awful. And they ruined uh, the lives of the two of them. Yeah, he, he was a, a, a Kurdish guy from Turkey uh, that she was married to, Yasser Gun. And uh, they made their, as you said, they made their life miserable. They were going to deport him, um, even though he was married to a British citizen, you know, and he, that, that creates uh, the way to be a citizen. And, and, they, and they, they tormented them. And in the end, it says that they wanted to make an example of her, right? Um, but British Petroleum had, had, Saddam Hussein had nationalized the oil fields in Iraq. And that was the whole impetus for George Bush, as I had alluded to, his, his, ass, his family's interests, their friends in Houston, uh, corporate interests, for oil, they wanted those oil fields back. So, and the same thing with British Petroleum. That was the, the those were the lobbying people both in England and in Britain and in America that were pushing for this. So, yeah, and they made their lives miserable, you know. And 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 uh, the well, they threw her in. They threw her in jail. Yeah, exactly. she, she was she was not really a flight risk or anything. She yeah. was, um, she had she had confessed. They threw her in jail for a while, a long time. Um, and they and they threw him out of the country or tried, they tried. and he, he used uh, his connections with some MP in Parliament to uh, to stay there because there were people who were protesting that and I, I guess the great percentage of the um, British population were ticked off at her for violating the Official Secrets Act. Um, but a lot of them agreed with her and thought that uh, this war was illegal. And then one of the public defenders that they that the, they they had to defend her, right? She said that I usually deal with you know petty criminals, and and she gave her the name of this liberty which helps you know uh, political prisoners, right? And and then Ralph Fiennes became his name was Ben in the movie. He became her attorney, and and he was a very smart guy. I mean it, the, the role that he was playing thought of what. What can they say to put to, you know, so that she doesn't get, um, you know, to defend her? I mean, what, what, and 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 they thought up this whole thing that they didn't know if it was going to work, but it was that she was protecting her country, right? And if they well, was, I think uh, that's true. Yeah. That is exactly what motivated her. Yeah. So they yeah. they fashioned a defense which was a real long shot because she'd already confessed that she did it and violated the Official Secrets Act. Yes. They fashioned a defense around her her true thoughts yes. um, that the war was illegal and what the government was doing and what the American government were doing, they were all wrong and acting illegally. <clears throat> so uh, his defense was faithful, you know, but I remember that, you know, the lawyers in the room, right? Uh, Ralph Fiennes, who's a brilliant actor, I'll never forget, in Schindler's List, he played the role of the Nazi who woke up in the morning and, and shot the Jewish people who were working in the construction site outside his window, um, you know, for sport. He went hunting every morning with his rifle from his window. Um, he was he was so mean in that uh, Schindler's List. He was he was he was extraordinary. But in this movie, he was also extraordinary. He played the role of a lawyer. I, his acting in this movie was out of this world. It was it was elegant. It was um, understated elegance. And uh, you, you could really mm, see him as the perfect lawyer for the case. They had a big argument, remember, with his staff. His staff said, you got to plead her guilty um, and, take, and you know, take what comes. And he said, no, we can't do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to have a defense. We're going to plead her not guilty, even though it's complicated. And he did. Um, that, that was extraordinary, too. The and whole the, legal, the legal aspect of this is a lawyer's dream movie, don't you think? Yes. And, and one of the interesting things with the prosecuting attorney, uh, uh, you know, the prosecutor, right, was a close friend of, of, of uh, Ben, who was the role that was being played by Ralph Fiennes. 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 And, and, and uh, 
and 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 they showed the interaction on the beach. The two of them are fishing at the end, you know. And and, and Ralph Fiennes finds Fiennes is is really angry at his friend. But but what they did is is at, at the end, and maybe I'm jumping the gun, is that um, they drop. You're jumping, you're jumping the gun. Okay. Yeah. So they're harassing her. Right. They're on a public relations campaign against her. Yeah. There's this Martin Bright person for the Observer trying to help her defend her. The anti-war people are trying to help her, but she's in terrible shape and she sticks with it. And she does, um, you know, ultimately, I think, I'm not sure if she was in jail at the end or not, but uh, yes. there's this long walk under the British courthouse in the dungeons and alleys of the building. Right. And she's walking through the tunnel there to she's come up into what, into what you know everybody thinks is this fine British example of justice. But in order to get there, you really had to go through the dungeons. <laughs> and she comes up there and the prosecutor has got a confession in his pocket. And Ralph Fiennes has got the defense of quote necessity end quote, which you can see how twisted that is um, you know, to argue that she did, she did it um, because she felt the war was illegal. Um, and there it, it was no defense like that in the law, no defense like that in the Official Secrets Act of 1989, but <clears throat> that was his defense. And then there's this remarkable, remarkable scene. It's enough to give you chills and spills for a week. What happened? Yeah. Well, the prosecuting, the prosecutor, right? The, the, Britons, the British government had decided to drop the case, you know, literally let, let her off, you know, uh, after tormenting her and her husband for, for over a year or something. Then they, so in the courtroom, you see the judge, right? And the judge who knows the precedents, you know, he's talking about Official Secrets Act. And he says, this is the Official Secrets Act. But then the prosecutor, you know, prosecuting attorney, prosecutor, decide, the British government, as I said, had decided to drop the case. So, so that's that's the, the the thing you know that you don't expect, right? Is that the the case was going to be is going to be dropped and she's a free person again? But she, but but she, you know, as Ralph Fiennes has said to his buddy, former buddy on the beach, you t put her through hell and her husband through hell for a whole year, and and he said, well, we wanted to make a an example of her, right? So, yeah. so, you know, and, and by that time, they knew that there was no weapons of mass destruction. We had gone into Iraq and, and there were no weapons of mass destruction. So this whole thing was a big, was fake, you know, it, it wasn't a real war. It was a war, as I had said, to help oil interests in America and in, in Britain. And, and that was what it was all about. And, and all those people who died, not only Iraqis, but American soldiers and, and, and you know, who, who died and got maimed. We send our, our young men and women to war to, to get killed for whose interests? For the interests of our oil interests, right? In this case, and our other, you know, lobbyists, powerful interests that that's what we're preserving, you know, instead of, I mean, all these young kids, they don't, they're young, they, they do crazy things, you know, they think they're invincible and they get killed. So that, that the whole thing is, there's still lessons for today. We're still dealing with this. Now, Bolton wants to go to Iran and blow them up. You know, um, I would like to see regime change in Iran, you know, but, but we're going to go, do we have to go to war to do that? I guess, you know, so the, there's pluses, you know, in, in certain cases, but War really is just brutal. Well, that, that's a big point here. War is brutal. These guys were playing with the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And it was all on a lie. Yeah. Uh, and, and they were using the, the worst strategies of manipulation and lying to each other um, and forcing each other into a war that was not justified. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of the Tonkin Gulf incident way back when that got us into uh, Vietnam. Not clear that we needed to go to war in Vietnam. Yeah. It was, uh, it was uh, a, the claim that we were attacked, that our, our naval vessels were attacked in the Tonkin Gulf. And it um, wasn't true. At least a lot of people don't feel it was true. 
And then we spent uh, 50,000 American lives uh, fighting Vietnam, and we were embarrassed at the end, and, 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 it, and it lost the confidence of the people. It lost the generation uh, that might have been confident in America, and they weren't, they aren't. It changed the, the course of history. And so, and so did the, the war in Iraq without any weapons of mass. You knew, I knew, as it was unfolding in the press, and the press knew, and the students knew, and academia knew, and anyone who really read it knew that this was phony. There were no weapons of mass destruction. And yet the White House you know, pushed this thing. And that's why this movie is so important, because it talks about a, a turning point, you know, a tipping point in confidence by Britain and by the US in, in government. Um, into a war where hundreds of thousands of people died really unnecessarily, as you said. So very powerful. It also, you know, to me, and I want to suggest another movie that covers this, uh, this uh, dynamic in Britain. They, they were really mean to, uh, what was her name? Jan, Jan um, Gunn, Gunn. Catherine, uh, the, and Catherine, Catherine Harwood Gunn. Can, can, yeah, Catherine Gunn. Uh, by the way, they showed a picture of her at the end of the real Catherine Gunn. And um, uh, as she came out of that, 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 that scene in the uh, courthouse, and she, she was sort of just like the actress, except she was blonde. The actress wasn't blonde, but she had the same style, same way of speaking. And you could, you could see in her the things that had been portrayed by her actor in the movie. Yeah. Um, but I thought I thought the Brits were really hard on her, unnecessarily so, um, and they didn't mind, you know, making life impossible for her. And I thought, well, you know, this, this is this really the Brits? And the the answer, in part, is found in the next movie I would like to review with you, called Sardar Udam. It's about a, an Indian man um, who um, is is part of a group that is still trying to do vengeance for the great massacre of 1919, where an enormous number of people, 20,000 people were killed, defenseless people were killed by the Brits. Um, and he's trying to do vengeance on that. And you can see how the Brits were into torture, including waterboarding. Um, they tortured anyone they thought had information for them, whether they had a good reason um, to think that or not. And that was in uh, late 30s, <clears throat> 20 years after um, the, uh, the massacre. So now here we are in the 2003, whatever it was, 2004, uh, during the, the Iraq war. They're also mean, not as mean, but mean. And it, you know, it just changes your view of how British justice works. Uh, everybody's very polite. Then they take them down in the basement, beat them up. Um, this, is, this is troublesome. The whole thing is troublesome, but I'll tell you, I went back and I looked at that last five minutes of the movie and give, we've given it away already, but it was so powerful. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her. She's ready to go to jail for life. In fact, I don't even know. They didn't have a capital punishment. But they, she could have gone to jail for life under that statute. And she had confessed. And the prosecutor was ready to go. He never telegraphed uh, anything about it his intentions or the crown's, um, you know, um, change, change of heart. And, and the judge says, okay, proceed. And he says, uh, sorry, judge, we aren't gonna introduce any evidence. The judge says, what? You have a confession. Judge. You know, how about proceeding? No, nope, we're not gonna do it. Why are you not gonna do it? You have a duty to the British people to proceed with this case. You're not going to introduce even the confession? Nothing? He says, yes, the Crown has changed its mind. After a year, it's not, it's not going to prosecute this case. Why not? And uh, this is really incredible interplay between the two lawyers. Well, Ralph Fine says to him, <clears throat> you know, we think it's because you don't want to reveal the papers we have subpoenaed from you. You don't want to tell us what happened. And, um, and, and how the, uh, the, the people around Tony Blair were telling him this war was illegal. Um, we, we think you don't want to talk about that. And the judge says to uh, the prosecutor, yeah, what is it? Why don't you want to talk about that? What's going on here? 
<laughs> and the prosecutor, who was the lead prosecutor for the Crown, something like, no, I've said all I'm going to say. Uh, we're simply not going to prosecute. Exactly. And the judge says, okay, okay, uh, Catherine Gunn. And this was the part where it just blew your mind. He says, you're free to go. Yep. What an amazing close that was. It's worth watching the movie for the last five minutes. She, Kira Knightley played that role of Catherine Harwood Gunn brilliantly. She's a good, really good actress. Yeah. Well, Very she put, portrays the, uh, the emotional strain. She, she kind of represents all of us. She, she didn't want to hurt anybody. She just couldn't stand the idea that all these people were going to get killed in a war that wasn't justified. It really bothered her. And, and in a moment of uh, strength, I suppose, other would, others would say weakness, she, she went for it. And she turned this thing over. She had second thoughts later. She is a John Q. Everyman character. She could be us. We could any of us find ourselves in that predicament. Yeah. She was not a professional security person for Britain. She'd only been there kind of as a back, backwater, or rather a backstop job, um, you know, a secondary type of choice for um, a job uh, for like less than two years. Uh, she could have been any of us. That was her conscience, you know, and she went, she went with what she felt. And Luckily, she was released. Otherwise, she would have, as you said, she would have been in prison for life, you know, under that um, Official Secrets Act. But Well, it but, talks about courage, doesn't it? I mean, part of the uh, Trump administration is the people who went along with him, who he bullied into go along with him, they didn't have courage. Some of them had courage later after it was too late, which I, you know, I don't appreciate that, really. I don't think any of us should appreciate that. Um, but but it's a story of uh, it reminds me of Anne Applebaum's article about how uh, Eastern Europe folded to the communists after World War II, and it was based on fear. It was based on a lack of courage, and that was what this you know ordinary middle class middle twenties person exhibited courage, and that's what people should have exhibited in the Trump administration that's courage, right. and that's how we save the democracy now standing up to power, courage. That's why the movie is so powerful, George. Yes, that's how it's very much apropos for today with what's going on with Donald Trump saying that he won the election and all his cronies are a majority, except for a few that have really courage, like Lynn Cheney, you know, are saying that, no, you know, and he, he's got everybody because of fear, you know, on that side of the aisle, that they just shut up and let him say his stupid, I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, they, they did that thing in Arizona and they, and Biden had more votes when the recount. Than, so, I mean, this, this movie is very good for what's going on today, as you have alluded to, totally. Yeah, well, that's why I like these uh, documentaries based on true stories where they try to be faithful to what happened. And uh, I'm sure they're, you know, thinking of these same issues when they put the movie together. They're thinking of why the Brits being so hard on her, uh, why are they being so mean. Um, they're thinking of, um, you know, the, um, the the failure of the morality in the British government at the time. You know, as a one it was um, one very senior, it was the prime minister or something, made a comment. No, it was an admiral an admiral who was going to lead the British uh, forces or supervise the, the war when the war happened. And he makes this very central statement. He said uh, something like, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to reveal official secrets when it's um, necessary for the conduct of the military. But when it's just a matter of embarrassing a politician, it shouldn't apply at all. <laughs> yeah. And that's the central theme in the movie. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, I mean, she was even saying, you know, Tony Blair, she, Tony Blair's on the TV and she says, oh, you, you know, garbage, you know, what he's saying, you know, that, that's what that's what really got her. So 
ticked off is when he gets up there on the TV and he's claiming things and she knew what were, were and true. Most of the Brits knew were and true. And she was going to do something about it. And she did something about it. I mean, she, as you said, she was thinking back and forth. Should she, should she not? And then, and then she just got the, I think when she saw uh, Tony Blair on the TV, that's what got her goat, you know, is she's going to go and, and do it. And she did it. And, uh, and that's why that final scene is so powerful because she's vindicated. And she's a hero to the British people. And they appreciated it. They extolled her virtue at the end that she was vindicated. Um, but the, the whole movie is, is a statement of how government lies to us. Yeah. And we should not tolerate that. That's what it's about. In this case, in this one case, um, she was vindicated, she came out a hero. It was worth the risk that she took, which was a huge risk. And it spoke well, ultimately, of the British government, ultimately. But I think the message is we cannot tolerate government lying to us. We cannot tolerate that. Yes. Totally agree. Yeah. Anyway, George, uh, we're out of time here, but uh, I hope we can do Sadr Udam which is another statement of the British government in the 30s and how they conducted themselves uh, against this um, Indian person who was mighty offended by um, the murder of uh, 20,000 defenseless Indians. Um, and um, I hope you can take a look at that. We can compare notes on it later on. Okay. Thank you, George. George Kaysen, this is what we need to do. Examine movies like this in the context of current events. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, Jay, for all your thoughts as well. Aloha. Aloha.